Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Eva Brito. I am the director of the Women's Center here at Bristol Community College, and you're here for our next uh, Stories That Inspire. I'm going to share a little bit about the Women's Center, and then we'll go into our program with our guest speaker. As you, um, for some folks may not know, that Bristol is one in three community colleges that have a Women's Center, so we're very fortunate to have a Women's Center. And that's a space where students can come and feel safe and supported. And we talk about a lot of the inequities that exist within the genders as well as provide resources for different individuals and really advocate for a more just world in the, um, uh, through the lens of gender. And we do a lot of different ways. We do that in different ways. Some of the programs we offer, I'm gonna share one that's coming up, which is the Women of Color series. We are always looking at the intersectionality between race and gender and culture and patriarchy and all these things, right? They're always intersecting. So for this uh, semester, we have a one of color series that it's in partnership with the YWCA and next one's November 18th. And we're looking at um, having folks join in. So we'll put that in the chat. We also have a parenting club and we're excited to announce that in the spring, we'll be launching a parenting support program called Parenting Advancement Program focused on single mothers and parenting students and having them have supports within the college and outside of the college or wraparound supports. So I could go on and on about the Women's Center, but I'm sure you're here today about our guest speaker and you're excited as I am. Stories That Inspire is really a series to hear someone's life story. I believe that we all can connect and learn from someone's life story. And we're never one thing. There's always intersectionality. There's always um, different ways that we look at life and all the different uh, events that happen to help us to be persistent and persevere. And this is another example of that. So today I'm excited to share that we have Carol Simpson and she's an award-winning journalist. And I'm not gonna go into the details because this is why we're here to hear her amazing story. So everyone, welcome Carol Simpson. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, are we beginning? I e Eva. Eva. <laughs> It's okay. We just found out we're neighbors uh, across the seas in the Martha's Vineyard. Um, yes, we are beginning and this is really a comfortable space. So um, feel free to share the story that you feel feels more comfortable to you. Okay. This is kind of weird for me because uh, I don't think I've ever told my story in my bedroom before. So I'm feeling very loose and comfortable and like... Uh, not like this is a real serious thing, but I know it is a serious thing. So I'll try not to uh, lounge too much. Um, before I begin about me, I have to say how thrilled I am about Kamala Harris. I was so excited the night that she became the vice president elect Oh my God, I was happy for Joe Biden, but I was so happy for her and for women around the country, uh, little black and brown girls that could look to her and see a role model. I have an 11 year old granddaughter and um, her mother, my daughter, has been exposing her as much as she could to this election and the presidential campaign. So after she was, um, her, her mother said, Kamala Harris is going to be the vice president. She's going to be the first black woman vice president. And my little granddaughter said, I can do that. And that's the whole thing that, um, you know, an accomplishment of that kind and historic accomplishment can do for young children. Um, it's, it's just very exciting. Uh, so I hope the rest of you were as thrilled about the vacation, about the vacation, about the election. See, I need a vacation. Oh God. I um, posted on Facebook that I have not slept for months. The first night I slept was Saturday night. I slept for six hours and I guess it was just waiting to exhale after this uh, presidential campaign has been so difficult. Is that a little person I see there? Yes, my little one is here <laughs> listening to your story. Can I see him? You wanna sit on mommy's lap so you can, you can. Oh my God, he inspires me. Hi, hi. 
Hi, what's your name? You're not going to tell me your name. Oh, this is the shy act that happens when he first meets you after. Oh, the I see. <laughs> I see. Well, a four year old boy, there's uh, hard to resist a four year old boy. So uh, I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> um, so, anyhow, back to Carol. Um, I guess you would like to know how I got into journalism. Um, what would make a little girl from the south side of Chicago think that she could be a journalist? Um, I didn't know that's what they were called. Um, I called them reporters. I wanted to be a newspaper reporter. I grew up in Chicago, not far from where um, Michelle Obama grew up on the south side of Chicago. And of course, that was the 1950s. Um, and, you know, all that a woman could be back in the 1950s could even think about being was a teacher, a nurse, a social worker. Those were pretty much the jobs that uh, women of my generation that were born when I was uh, could aspire to. So um, I just I just liked the idea of writing and people's stories. And that's why it's nice to be part of the stories that inspire because what I like to say about myself is that I have been, I was a storyteller for 40 years on television. Um, and there's nothing more interesting to me than to get to know a person and tell their story and tell their story in a way that it will influence others that may see it. So I decided that I might want to be a reporter. And so I went to high school in Chicago. And at my high school, I had an English teacher who said that I wrote pretty well. So she said, why don't you join the high school newspaper? I hadn't thought about that before, but I did because you needed all those activities, right, to go to college, to get in a good college. So I joined the newspaper and I loved it because I could go around and talk to the teachers and the principal and other students and ask them questions and they'd answer them. And then I would write a story and it would be in the paper and I could see my byline by Carol Simpson. And that was particularly exciting. And then you got to be known around the school. Um, and people would come to you with, with stories. So when I was a junior, I told my parents that I wanted to be a journalist. And my parents were, what, a what? Um, and I explained to them that I wanted to be a reporter. I wanted to report the news. I wanted to have my byline in a newspaper. And they poo-pooed me, are you crazy? Uh, you can't do anything like that. Nobody's going to hire you to be something like that. And they said, you need to be a teacher. Be, go to Chicago Teachers College and become a nice English teacher. And then if you want this journalism thing, you do that later, not now. And I was just determined. I said, I don't want to waste the time being a teacher. I want to be a journalist. I want to write. And so we fought and we fought. And as I say, you have to, you have to remember that back in the 50s, were there any Black women reporting? Were there any Black women on television? Uh, no. So they were looking out for my best interest. And so finally they said, okay, if that's what you want, and um, I had been a good student uh, and was involved in a lot of activities. So they knew I was pretty smart. Uh, so they said, okay, if this is what you wanna do, we'll support you. So I applied to Northwestern University, which is in Evanston, Illinois, right outside Chicago. And at the time it had the best journalism school in the country. So I thought, well, that's where I want to go. And I applied and I went to um, 
the admissions office on campus at Northwestern and I met with an admissions counselor and I told this white man that I wanted to be a journalist and um, I thought Northwestern had one of the best schools and that's why I wanted to go there. And so, as I tell you, my record was good. I had a B plus average. And as I say, I had a zillion activities that I was in. I should have been a prize to anyone, but he said, you can't do this. You, you, you're never gonna be a journalist. You might work for Ebony Magazine or for um, the Chicago Defender, which was a black newspaper, but nobody's gonna hire you. You're colored and you're female, um, and nobody's hiring people like that. And I was devastated. I just, I, I knew what was going to happen. And yes, I got the letter a few weeks later saying we regret to inform you that oh, you are not admitted here. <laughs> and I was so hurt. I was so hurt. It was like, why would they tell me I can't be what I prepared to be and want to be um, a journalist because of my color and my sex? And I was furious. I was just, this is not fair. This isn't right. Uh, my parents, I know, were looking askance, uh, but they didn't say, we told you so. So I was glad they didn't do that. But I... Uh, tell people that that was the first time, that was the first no that I took internally, like a vitamin pill. I took the no and I swallowed it and it gave me energy, like Popeye with his spinach. Uh, I just felt tougher and meaner and more determined. This wasn't fair. This was not fair. Um, so I applied to the University of Michigan and I got into the University of Michigan and lo and behold, I was the only black student out of 64 that were in the journalism class my year. And so I worked hard at college, got good grades again, worked on the Michigan Daily, which was the daily newspaper. And Again, I had the goods, I had the smarts, I had the grades, I had some experience now. So I'm getting ready for graduation and at the placement bureau, they had all kinds of uh, newspapers and magazines and television stations interviewing people. And I went to all the interviews and I swear at every one of them, I got the same story that I had three strikes against me. I was a Negro, I was a woman, and I was inexperienced. And none of these newspapers and television stations wanted to take a chance on me. Again, these no's, I was so mad. I was, how could they do this? I mean, I grew up in an integrated situation. So the, um, issues of segregation and discrimination had not really been a big part of my life as if I had been living in a black neighborhood and gone to black schools. I was in this integrated situation. So I thought I was just like everybody else and should not be treated differently. But boy, did I learn, oh yes, you're colored, you're a woman, um, you ain't gonna make it. So, I felt terrible and I graduated from the University of Michigan and went to work at the Chicago Public Library where I had worked every summer from the time I was 15 years old. The Dean of the school said that he was gonna work all summer trying to find me a job. But I, I was the only black in the school in my graduating class and the only one that didn't have a job. And the rest of my friends are going off to their jobs in media and I'm checking out books at the public library. In about August, uh, the Dean called me and said, Carol, I've lined up an internship for you at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And I'm going Tuskegee Institute. 
in Alabama. I had been born in Chicago. And this was 1960, 1962, excuse me. And the civil rights movement was well underway in Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi. And of course, people were getting beaten and killed. And this is the only job I had. But I said, I'll go. And my parents were just horrified that, you know, I was going to start out my career in the South at this period of time. Um, and I decided I'm scared, but I'm going to go. And it was the only job I had. So I flew to Alabama. I didn't fly to Alabama. I flew to Georgia and then had to take a bus to Alabama because Tuskegee is located in a very rural area of Alabama. It's a town of 5,000 people. And the college had about 2,000 students, all Black, historically Black uh, college. And my job was to uh, send out press releases on events that were happening at the college. So I was writing. They also had me teach a course in journalism to Tuskegee students. And I was advisor to the student newspaper. So I had a lot of experience, a lot of opportunities to do things at Tuskegee. And it was an unbelievable experience having grown up in Chicago, as I said, in going to mostly integrated um, situations and to go to the rural South at the height of the civil rights movement and face segregation was an amazing experience. It was a frightful experience, but when I look back on it, it was a great experience. The point I'm trying to make with uh, you young women who may be listening is you don't turn your back on anything. I've had students tell me, I taught for 12 years at Emerson College and I've heard students tell me, oh, I don't wanna go, I wouldn't go to Alabama. I, blah, blah. <laughs> they wanna be working in LA or New York or Chicago or wanna be in a big city. And it's like, no you take the job where it is. And as I say, it meant so much to me to know what it was like to be black in the South. We couldn't go to the movie theater except to sit up in the balcony, which we were not allowed on the first floor of the movie theater. Uh, and you had to bring your own concessions. You had to bring your own popcorn and candy because we weren't allowed down there where it was sold. And it was filthy up in the balcony. They never cleaned it or anything like that. Um, in Montgomery, Alabama, where I had to shop for clothes, we were not allowed to try them on. I had to hold up a dress to me and see if it might fit because we couldn't go into the fitting rooms. Later, they had colored fitting rooms and white fitting rooms. But I, I just want to stress with you how amazing the experience was for me to be a reporter later on and having to cover some of these issues, because you can't tell me about it. I lived it. I knew what it was like. Um, so I was there for two years. Um, I had to sit in the colored waiting rooms at the bus station. I had to do all of the things and you just feel so horrible. I just I couldn't believe that in America, this was going on and that I was not as good as these white people who had on overalls sitting in the nice white waiting room. And I've got a degree from the University of Michigan and I'm smart and I'm sitting out here on this terrible colored waiting room outside. Um, I was in Alabama for two years and I decided still had to be a reporter. I wasn't what I wanted to be. So I decided I'd go to graduate school. And I ended up at the University of Iowa uh, only because they offered me the best um, fellowship there. So while I was at Iowa, I was working for the professor who edited the radio television news director's bulletin. And I was his assistant. And that was my fellowship. So I had to write stories for um, this bulletin about radio TV. 
I had always wanted to be a newspaper reporter. I hadn't really thought about radio and television, but I started getting interested in it. So I um, had a, a space in my course for a two hour course and I couldn't figure out what to put in that two hour course. And there was a radio TV workshop. So I decided to take that. And uh, that's when I fell in love with broadcasting because not only could I go out and do a story, I could come back, I could edit the tape, I could write it, and then I could deliver it myself on the air. So this took newspaper reporting to a whole nother level. This is my story and I'm delivering it. So I uh, applied for the radio station and um, I, I was the first woman to broadcast news on WSUI in Iowa City. And um, I had a professor who said, Carol, you know, you've got a good voice. Uh, you ought to think about broadcasting. You know, things are going to be opening up. This is 1964, 65, okay? Uh, things were still hot all over the nation as far as race was concerned. So I thought, well, maybe so. I might enjoy that. So again, I leave Iowa after working on my master's and I started applying for jobs and people were calling me, newspapers were calling me from all over the country. They needed black reporters. It's 1965, the Watts riots had occurred in California. Uh, people were being killed. Uh, white people didn't know why are these black people rioting? What's going on? Um, and so they needed black reporters who could go into black neighborhoods and get the story. A lot of the white reporters were too afraid. They didn't want to go. <laughs> so um, they were running around trying to hire black reporters all over the place, teachers, uh, sales clerks, whatever. They just wanted somebody black that could um, go get this story. So all of a sudden my race and my, and my gender had become very attractive because a lot of the demonstrators were female and they thought I could get to talk to them the way others could not. So I was about to take a job at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch as a uh, a reporter, uh, a print reporter, when I got a call from WCFL radio in Chicago, which was a huge 100,000 watt station uh, that was heard in New York, in the state of New York. Uh, it was, it had such a powerful signal. And they asked me if I wanted to come there and work in radio. And it was in Chicago, big city. It was my home. I certainly knew the news that was going on there. So I took that job and became the first woman to broadcast news in Chicago. Um, I was immediately a household name because I worked for this huge radio station. And then I went to work for the all news station and people had not heard a woman broadcast the news. They were like shocked and I hoped they liked it. But anyhow, I would go out on stories and uh, I would say, I'm, I'm Carol Simpson from CBS radio. And they'd go, you're who? And I said, I'm Carol Simpson. No, you're not. <laughs> I said, what makes you think I'm not? Because you don't sound black. Carol Simpson does not sound black. I said, do I sound black? Uh, no. And I said, I'm Carol Simpson. They couldn't believe it that I was able to speak. Um, and they would come up to me and say, how does somebody colored talk like that? Did you have to take special speech lessons? I mean, it was as if they never had heard anyone uh, of color uh, be able to speak authoritatively and distinctly and pronounce words correctly. So it was very funny, but because I was the only woman, everybody knew who I was. And I was in radio for, um, 
five years in Chicago, and then I was contacted by the NBC station, the television station. And I was like, oh God, I don't know if I can do TV, um, but I could do TV. All you're doing is adding pictures to what you'd already done as a reporter on the writing and all of that. And you just have the video to put in and the sound bites to put in. So um, I went to work at, and again, became the first woman to do uh, news on a local station in Chicago, the NBC station. And then I became the first woman to broadcast a newscast. I did the weekend newscast on, um, on NBC. Well, the executives in a NBC in New York heard about me, looked for my, looked at my work, and they called and said, we'd like to make you a network correspondent to come to New York and become a correspondent here. Now that was my dream was to work for a network because while I was happy in Chicago and it was a great news town, um, being able to report on news that affected everybody in the country, as well as people all over the world was just my dream. And I wanted to go to Washington. I really wanted to cover the White House and Congress and all the stuff that was happening in Washington, DC. So they hired me. <laughs> and by this time I was married and I had a little girl that was three years old. And my husband was very successful in his career as a nuclear engineer at Argonne National Laboratory. We had met at the University of Michigan and he left his job to follow me to Washington because he knew this is what I wanted. Uh, girls, you gotta marry the right man. You really do have to marry the right man. Uh, his family was horrified that he would leave his job and follow me to, um, to Washington, D.C., but he felt confident he could get a job. And as I said, we made a deal. I said, if there's ever a job that you feel that you cannot turn down, I will leave what I'm doing and go with you. So that was our little deal. And we moved to Washington and he ended up getting a great job. <laughs> so uh, to try to short circuit this now, I um, let me go back. Um, let me go back to Chicago. Uh, and the local stations that I worked for, NBC in particular. I want to talk about the sex discrimination and the racial discrimination that I went through. Um, and I'm sorry to say, since you know there's a Me Too movement, that it hasn't ended. It's not over. And those of us that came along in the 70s thought we had ended it. Okay, we were the women of the 70s, women's liberation movement and all that. Uh, and we worked hard in all of our workplaces trying to end it. I had men uh, reach down inside. I'll be standing talking to them in the hall. They just reach down inside my blouse and grab my breast. Um, and you're like, what? what is happening? What are you doing? <laughs> And you know, I, I grew up very afraid. I was always afraid to say something, to rock the boat, to, oh, I might lose my job. And let me tell you, by the time you get to be 35, you don't care about that anymore. You don't care about what they think of, of you. You're just not gonna take it anymore. You become mature and you become knowledgeable and you're just not going to take the BS anymore. I had them reach up my skirt and uh, pull at my panties. Uh, you know what uh, President Trump was accused of doing, um, <laughs> not accused of doing, he said he did it on the Access Hollywood tape. Um, that's what men would try to do to me. It, and it's like men I worked with, uh, other reporters, cameramen. Um, it was just horrendous and there was no one to go to because among the people that had sexually harassed me were bosses. Where do you go? Where do you go to, to 
tell on your boss. I mean, now there's all these corporate things and you can go, there are, there are channels and all that. But back when we were dealing with this in the 70s, um, there was nothing. And we just commiserated with ourselves and tried to tell the men, stop it, leave me alone. Don't ever do that again, blah, blah, blah. Which they just laughed off like nothing. Uh, the um, horrible conversations I had to listen to of men's sexual conquests. When I was in TV, you travel with the crew and that's the cameraman and the lighting man and the sound man and me. I'd be in the car and have to listen about their sexual conquests, what they had done to some woman the night before. And I would say, I really don't want to hear that. I wish you wouldn't talk about that. Um, and it, it, just, it just seemed like sex was permeating. You, you couldn't say anything without somebody turning it into sexual connotation. Like one guy was named Dick and I said, Dick, come. And oh my God, they just went crazy with that. Um, oh, Carol said, Dick, come. <laughs> um, and it was just so, so debilitating. And so you talk about a hostile work environment and you have to try to work and do your best because they always thought the women were not as good as the men. So you did your best uh, with that kind of stuff hanging over your head. So anyhow, as I, I was 35 when I moved to Washington, they like network correspondents who have had a lot of experience uh, in local news before they come to the network. So I worked for NBC in Washington happy as a clam, covering the White House and Congress and the State Department, Supreme Court, everything. I had such an education uh, covering all of those different uh, branches of government and departments of government. And then I um, was courted by ABC News. Um, and in 1982, I left NBC and went to work at ABC in Washington. And that's where I was for the last 24 years of my career. And I did everything. I, I like to tell people about how rewarding and challenging this job is because I ended up going to 70 countries. I covered, I covered news in 29 of them. I've been to 48 of the 50 states. I didn't get to Montana and Alaska, and I got to do that before I die, so I get all 50. Um, I've met people, I've met kings and queens and uh, death row inmates, um, just the most amazing experiences um, being a reporter and uh, being exposed to all of those things. And then I became an anchor for the weekend news and became the first black woman to anchor a network newscast. Um, so as you see my career, because I was early in it, I was like the first and the only and the first and the only and the first and the only. But while I was doing that, I was hoping that I was breaking down barriers for those women of color who came behind me. Um, I, was never a person. There are some women that I met in this business. And I'll have to say they were not black women. They were typically white women. But once they got theirs, that was it. I've got mine. I don't care about anybody else. But I always felt that I had an obligation to those who were coming behind me to make a difference and to make to be as excellent as I could possibly be so that they would not uh, you know, say, hey, a black woman can't do this. No, I'll show you I can. And I won't just be a good reporter, but I'm going to be the best reporter. And as I say, there were no's throughout my career, throughout my career. And each time it made me stronger and I used it. I used it to give myself uh, more strength to handle the abuse. Um, to um, handle the disappointments. 
Uh, I often wonder if I had been born with blue eyes and blonde hair, uh, how much farther I might have been in my career. I think about uh, Diane Sawyer, who is a friend of mine, um, and I didn't get to be Diane Sawyer. As far as I got was doing the weekend news, but there's going to be a Black woman who will <laughs> anchor the evening news someday. Uh, I'm real thrilled about Joy Reid, who has a primetime show, an evening show on MSNBC. And I'm just seeing fantastic young African-American women and Hispanic women and Asian women that are doing terrific jobs. And, um, you know, we just need more women in management who will not look at women as a sex object, but will measure them on their merit and on their ability and on the quality of their work. But too often with men, that sexual component comes in and um, they wanna be surrounded by women that will, as I, I remember they said of one woman anchor, she makes me orgasmic. That's like, oh, please, you know, we're trying, we're trying to do the news. We're trying to inform the American people of what is going on. Um, so in, um, in um, 19, no, 2006, I retired from ABC News. I was 65, I was able to do it. I could have stayed there, but I decided I wanted to be in Boston near my daughter and my three grandchildren. So my husband and I moved to Boston and working with the Old Girls Network, I was able to get a job at Emerson College and I was distinguished journalist in residence and taught there for 12 years, which I loved. I absolutely loved. And guess what happened at Emerson? I fought race discrimination and sex discrimination my entire career. I get to Emerson and I'm confronted with age discrimination. I'm going, oh no, 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 no. You're not gonna do it to me again. Yes, they are. Um, but I didn't take it standing, you know, I didn't take it sitting down. Um, I fought back and um, reached a settlement. Um, and so I said, let me get out of this business. <laughs> It is now time for me to do what I want to do. And that's what I'm doing. I started a video blog. It's called Wow for the Wise Old Woman. You can see my stuff. I do something once a week. I'm just now uh, recording one about the presidential election. But look at YouTube and you can see all of the vlogs I've done. And it's wonderful because I'm still, I still feel part of the news and I still have to watch it so that I can talk about it, but I'm trying to give my take on it. Older, older women are disappearing. They disappear from um, television, from all kinds of jobs. They disappear from academia. And the word is that if a woman, an old woman were to go in a grocery store and just start stuffing stakes in her clothes and stealing food and she'd get away with it because nobody notices an old woman um and it's like on the street they don't they don't whistle anymore they don't you know say things to you and it's like you're not a sexual being anymore so you're not that important and i want to show that older women can be bodacious and still have a lot to say. Um, and um, I'm gonna do my part to also bring the voices of older women to the news flow. So with that, I guess I should stop and see if you have any questions. Um, I hope that gave you, I hope that was a story that inspires. I don't know, I hope. 
What do you say, Eva? I say absolutely. I, I felt like I could resonate with a lot of the things you said, and it's inspiring to hear your story. Um, I wanted to open up to the group as well. If folks have questions or comments regarding your story. I, I would like to um, say, I apologize, Carol, for being late, but I also taught at Emerson when you were there. And now I'm with Shelley at BCC. I'm and looking at your face. I only see half of it, so I don't recognize it. <laughs> well, there, I, okay. <laughs> but I, I, think I saw you around. <laughs> Carol, I just want to say that I grew up, you know, being a, a news junkie, as they say. But I always look to you, from my recollection, I think it was in the 1970s, I used to watch you on the news and I think of you as I think of you as an anchor, but I also remember that you were one of the people I always listened to and always loved and I mean always when Shelley said that you were coming today. I couldn't believe it. I was, just, I was thrilled. <laughs> one thing that's horrifying I'll say Carol I'll echo what you sh what you said shared earlier. Um, I interned in Washington and I you know I knew tip O'Neill and I, I mean I knew everybody that you knew as you know. And uh, Tip was very good to me. And I remember President Reagan and Tip and the, all of that. And I like them both. People you know, might be horrified in New England, but I, I, I like them. <laughs> but Carol, here's the thing. I was horrified to learn, like you did, the way that sex seemed to intercede in everything and how these men in particular, and some women, but how these men behaved. It was horrifying. And the end of my insight was, was Carol, to echo what you shared was I called my parents and said, I can't stay here. This is oh. how I was raised. Where was their moral underpinning? Where was the fabric of who they are? And my mom and my dad said, you know, it's tough it out. And then I left horrified. And I'm sure it's not any better today. But no. Th <laughs> thank you so <laughs> much, your, Carol. Look thank at you. our president, your president, our president. I mean, my God, no, it's bad. It's really bad. And uh, look, all these men that I worked with, Matt Lauer, uh, Mark Halperin, uh, Bill O'Reilly, these are all people I worked with through the years. Uh, who else is out there and hasn't come back on the scene anymore? Um, just the ri ri ridiculous things they were doing. I mean, recently, not that long ago, it's Chris Matthews. I know his wife, <laughs> I know his children. It's like, what are they thinking? And Carol, you know you know what's funny? I remember Tip saying to me one day, we walked along and I was walking with Tip O'Neill and Henry Kissinger and, you know, and all these, you know, big shots, quote unquote. But I remember Tip saying to me, Bobby Burns, so my, you know, my, I'm Robert Burns, but he always said, Bobby Burns, don't become like them. Can you imagine like the head of the whole, don't become like them? And of course I didn't. But I, I mean, I remember what Tip Tip would whisper to me, and, and and it was horrifying, Carol. Everything that you said has affected me again because it was a horrifying experience for a young man. Horrifying. Oh, okay. well, you can imagine what it is for a young woman. <laughs> yes, very much so. Very much so. Because they're salivating at you, uh, and then again, because I was a woman of color, they think you're easy. Black girls were easy. You know, you can. You can do what you want with them. They don't have any moral character. So I think I got hit with it a lot more. And I was this Sunday school. <laughs> My parents were Sunday school teachers. I went to Sunday school, but nobody would think that. If, um, yeah, yeah. Carol, I was wondering if I, yeah. I wonder if I can ask a question, Carol. Um, you know, um, you have a very distinguished career, and you know, you had the opportunity to um, host and moderate uh, a debate, presidential debate, um, back in the day. First of all, how would you have handled the debates this year, and how do uh, how do you feel uh, Kristen Welker did in her role? Uh, I've been doing a lot of interviews uh, during this uh, fall campaign, the general campaign. Uh, I was on the BBC, that's what they wanted me to tell them. I did Canadian TV. It's really nice to do stuff uh, overseas, but uh, it shows the reach of television because they remember who I am and they saw who I am and asked me to appear. 
Um, first of all, they all wanted to know what I would have done during the first debate if I had been Chris Wallace what I would have done with Trump acting so bad, obstreperous. <laughs> and I said, I think Chris did as best as he could. I mean, he was trying really hard to get them, to have him stop interrupting. I mean, short of going, the only thing I could think of is that I would have just taken my mic off and walked up on that stage and <laughs> grabbed him by his necktie and said, listen, you behave, stop that. Um, I don't think he could have done anything more. Uh, Kristen Welker, however, had a different situation because of the mute button that would keep him quiet for two minutes. Uh, he didn't get to be as rowdy and um, as he had been before. Uh, but I think she did an excellent job. Her questions were excellent. Uh, the whole debate was on a higher level. Um, I think people were able to get some information out of them. Um, and so I think she did a terrific job. And on Facebook, I said so. I'm very proud of her. I have a question. Um, you've interviewed so many folks. But is there uh, one or two that come to mind as being most memorable um, that you've interviewed? There are so many. And I think it's not going to be somebody that you would think I would pick. The first one I would pick was a young man who was 21, who was on death row and he was going to be executed that night. And I interviewed him in the morning for Nightline. He had been 14 years old with his 22 year old brother and his 22 year old brother had given him PCP and they went and killed two young people and brutalized them terribly. Um, and he was found guilty of murder. And they had been working for years and years and years, the sentencing project and people against the death penalty had been working because he was so young at 14 and to have been fed PCP uh, by his brother that he really wasn't responsible like his brother was, who was executed. Um, and I talked to him about how he felt and he cried and cried and cried and um, he was not mentally all there either. And I'll just never forget that. And that he was going, he died that night and I'd been talking to him and you know, it's a human being, it's a human being. Um, and that just, I'll, I'll never forget that one. The other one I won't forget is in Kentucky in the hollers of Kentucky. I don't know if everybody knows what a holler is, but in Kentucky, it's very hilly and hauled out in some of these foothills of the mountains or what's called a holler. And people have put homes in there. And there are mostly ramshackle um, cottages and things like that. Uh, not a very nice place to live, but I went to, um, I went to one of these, it was a trailer that had newspaper up at the window. I went inside and it was, it was just horrible inside there. And there was a young white woman and she had four children that she was tending to. Her husband was working in a coal mine. And I talked to this woman about uh, poverty and that kind of thing. And you would not believe the, um, her intuition about what was really going on in the world, <laughs> about capitalism, about foreign aid. We feed these people overseas and can't feed the people here in this country. She was just amazing. And you know, you, you have these stereotypes of a hillbilly um, and you, you have an idea of how they'll speak and what they'll know and stuff like that. And you're wrong. You're wrong. So those are the people that that I remember. That um, just um, it's hard to forget. 
it's hard to forget those kind of interviews. Politicians, movie stars, those are just what? They're like what? They're themselves. They're they're proud of themselves and arrogant and uh, so those interviews I don't like, but you have to do them sometime. Yeah, um, Carol, you remind me of in a past um, job, I worked as a social worker and at times I would have to um, visit inmates, um, fathers and cases. And so often you would hear, you would look at the, you know, charges and some of them had, you know, such long charges and you would assume that, you know, what's going to happen when I speak to this individual. But, you know, every, in my case, anyway, every time I had these conversations, to your point, they're human beings, they wanted to know about their children, they wanted, we had good conversations and you saw you know, the beauty of their spirit. And that's so often we forget that, that regardless of where they're located, they're still human beings and had a great conversation. So you just made me think of that. There's another uh, young woman I talked to that I won't forget. I did something on crack babies uh, during the crack e epidemic when a lot of babies were being born addicted to crack and having all kinds of uh, mental and physical developmental problems. And I met this young woman and she was pregnant. She had five children. She was pregnant again. She was 31. And they told her if this baby came out addicted to crack, she was going to lose all of her children. And what was so interesting is that these crack mothers, even though they're crack mothers, you're ready to believe they hate their kids. They don't care about anything uh, but themselves. They're willing to let their... These women loved their children and wanted their children, but were so addicted to crack, which is just almost impossible to overcome. And so I told her, why did, when did you start taking crack and why would you take it? And she said, I was 14. I came home from school. My dad had a sawed off shotgun and he shot my mother's head off and her face was sliding down the living room wall. And I can just see that in my mind over and over again. And when I heard that story, she couldn't get it out of her mind. And so somebody offered her some crack and that's how she got started. You know, but I heard that story and I'm thinking, shoot, I might've taken crack too. If, if I had seen something like that, you know, you don't know why people start it, but with her, I was like, yeah, you're 14 and this is all you can see. Um, so it's, it's all those surprising things that you hear and that these mothers love these babies and want them so badly. Carol, I have a question for you. I know that you had mentioned that you met Martin Luther King Jr. kind of early, I guess, in the civil rights uh, movement. Um, did he strike you as, like, as you were saying, the politicians, the celebrities, you know, they're just, they're not that, those strong. What, do you, what was it like to meet him and what did you think of him? Oh my God, that's a whole story. <laughs> Remember I told you it was a long story. You don't have time for this long story, do you? I have faith that you can put it into a, a compression for us. You're a journalist. You can do anything in a minute 30. I know you can. <laughs> I have to build to it though. Oh, Anyhow, I, think I you was in hear. Chicago. It was 1966 and I was in Chicago and I was reporting for radio and Dr. King had done all of his stuff in the South and he had announced that he was going to move to Chicago and confront housing segregation in Chicago. At that time, Chicago was the most segregated city in the United States. And it was because of all the black people lived on the South and West sides, all the white people lived on the North side. And so he wanted to come and and show that there is segregation in the North. It's not de jure, which means by law, it's de facto, it is by fact segregation. So he was planning to come to Chicago. And of course the news media is crazy in Chicago. Like who's gonna, what's he gonna do here? Why is he gonna, he hadn't said why he was coming. 
what's he going to do here? Carpetbagger, Mayor Daley was just all upset. He has no business coming to Chicago. So we found out that a plane from Delta was going to be arriving at O'Hare Airport at a certain period of time. And we had found out when he left Atlanta. And so we were all, all the media, which was a huge press corps in Chicago, all of us went to O'Hare. They put me on the story because I was black and they thought I might be able to get closer to him than anyone else. So we all went to the airport and it's like a madhouse with the number of cameras and reporters and everything. And I'm there with my tape recorder. So the plane arrived, so-and-so from Delta arriving gates, I don't know. So we're all ready while the people are coming off the plane. Of course, they had taken him down the back on the tarmac. They had a car and they drove him away. So now all the press is here wondering, okay, where did he go? Where did he go? Oh, everybody said, well, he stays at the Palmer House, which is a hotel downtown. He must be going there. So I listened to them all and something just told me he ain't going to go there. If they think he's going to go there, he's not going to go there. So I decided that he might be staying around the airport where nobody would see him. There were motels and crappy little things around the hotel, around the airport at that time. So I go driving my car. I go from hotel to hotel. There must have been about eight of them. And I went in, is Dr. King registered here? <laughs> like somebody would tell me yes, or something like that. But I did, I went around to all the hotels. I'm by myself, nobody else is doing what I'm doing. So about the seventh hotel, and I'm getting very disgusted. I said, is there any chance Dr. King is registered here? And it was something about how that hotel clerk looked. It looked like she was surprised when I said that. And I said, aha, this is a different reaction than I got. You got to be savvy to body language and tone of voice, all those things. So I said, mm hmm. She said, no. And I said, okay, thank you very much. When she wasn't looking, this is one of those hotels that just had one column of elevators going up just a rectangular building. So there was this center bank of elevators. So when she wasn't looking, I got on the elevator. I stopped at the second floor, nothing, no activity. Third floor, no activity. Fourth floor, I'm going floor by floor. And I get up to the seventh floor of the eight story hotel. And I see all these black men down at the end of the hall. And I look, I get off and I look and I see Dr. Ralph Abernathy, I see C.T. Vivian, I see James Bevel. These are all men I had seen on TV uh, from the stories from his uh, civil rights crusade in the South. And I'm going, oh my God, this is it. This has got to be it. He's got to be here. So I um, went to the corridor and these two men came forward as I start to walk down this corridor. And um, one of the men said, young lady, where are you going? And I said, I, I want to see Dr. King. <laughs> and he said, you can't see Dr. King. And I said, why not? I just wanted to get an interview with him. And they said, no, you can't see him. And I was, please, <laughs> they were black men. So I felt I could do the little girl thing. Please let me see him, please. Um, they said, no. So I said, doggone it. And I decided I'm gonna stay here. He's, he's gotta come out of that room sometime, someplace, somehow. And I said, it was about 7.30 in the evening. I set down my, um, my tape recorder, uh, my coat, it was January, winter, very cold. And I sat by the elevator bank. And so 
I um, sat there and when people would come, some people went down to get a meal uh, in the lower lobby um, area. And they said, why are you still here? And I said, I want to see Dr. King. Well, you're not going to see Dr. King. He's going to have a press conference in the morning. Go to the press conference at 10 o'clock. And I said, no, but I want to see him now. <laughs> I want to see him tonight. And so they laughed at me, ha, ha, ha. And then about, uh, I'm sitting on this cold marble floor, put my coat down and sat on it. I had some crackers. Always put something in your purse, young ladies. If you're going to be a reporter, you never know when you're not going to eat again. So always have granola bar, raisins, nuts, something in your purse. So I had my crackers and there was a machine. I got a Coke um, and I waited and I waited and I waited. At about 1130, they were still milling down around there. There was all kinds of activity. See, I'm not doing good, Shelly. I'm not making it short. Um, so anyhow, but you do have to hear this. Yeah. So I, I um, was still looking at them and stuff, still kind of somebody will take pity on me. Uh, some other men came out to me at 1130 and they said, you're still here? I said, yes, yes, I'm going to stay here till I see Dr. King. So they said, okay, you're not going to see him till the news conference. So I stayed there. I had a newspaper I could read. I was just going crazy. I called my office. There was a telephone booth right near the elevator bank. I called them. I told them what I was doing. I said, I'm going to stay here. If I have to stay here all night, he's going to have a press conference in the morning, but maybe I can get him before the press conference. So they said, okay, do what you want to do. So I stayed there all night, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock. I'm trying to stay awake. I'm trying to see what's happening. Um, I must have looked a wreck. I was sleeping on my coat. Um, and then about 7 a.m., I hear doors opening down at the other end of the hall. So I said, this must be it. This must be it. So I try to straighten myself. I'm all wrinkled mess. I tried to put on some lipstick. I tried to get myself together and I was ready. And um, I waited and waited. And all of a sudden I see Dr. King surrounded by these other men start walking toward me. I get cold pimples while I'm talking about it now because it was like, it was like there was an aura around him. I mean, all that I had heard about him and seen about him, you know, it was like, here he is right in my line of sight. He's walking towards me. And so he came forward and came forward. Nobody told. And so he came right up to me and he said, so you're the young lady they've been telling me about. I said, yeah, Dr. King, I've waited here all night to try to see you. I, I, I'm a young reporter in Chicago and it would be great if you could tell me why you were bringing your campaign to the North please. <laughs> and he said, come here. And I leaned over and he whispered in my ear that he was here to challenge the, um, the regime of Mayor Richard J. Daley. He was going to draw attention to the segregated housing patterns in Chicago, and he was going to work to fight the segregated housing in Chicago. And then he said, now, don't tell anybody. And I went, don't tell anybody. What are you talking about? And so he smiled and he got on the elevator and he looked at me and he said, young lady, I expect big things of you. You have a lot of perseverance. And you can imagine, I that was just... I mean, for Dr. King to say something like that to me was just, you know, I thank him. I mean, he put me on the map because within minutes I was on the telephone 
and they had put me into the network as well as the local station and I broke the news of what King was going to do. That was almost two and a half hours before he was to have his news conference. And everybody had to go with my story. WCFL reports that Dr. King is here to do such and such. So it was the first big scoop that I got. I got many more throughout my career, but that was the most important one and um, just left me uh, flying on air. Awesome. Thank you. It was worth the time, Carol. It was. We needed to hear <laughs> As I said, you did the build up. <laughs> it did. I'll give you that. <laughs> worth every minute. Um, we're about time. I don't know if there's any other pressing um, questions or comments that folks want to say before we let Carol go. Otherwise, I will close. Joyce is off. raising her little yeah, finger. Just, yeah, I couldn't figure it out. Carol, I thank you so much for coming to us. I was with in Shelly's class on October 22nd. And I said to Shelly, meeting Carol is life changing. Oh, how sweet. I get all <laughs> emotional because our students don't have a lot of role models. And I wish there were more students here tonight. But I said, if they could only understand this is a real person. And we get so much fake news. And we've had such a lousy four years <laughs> amen to that yeah. so thank you thank you so much i appreciate that I really well, we appreciate that. you i do get emotional because i think of discrimination for female for race for age and how people can be so mean to other people and for four years our president has encouraged people being mean to other people exactly. and some of our students who are not as strong or don't have good role models they they don't they don't know what to do and some of them have taken some made some bad choices mm -hmm. based on what they see and it's hard to blame them because like you say with your story about the 14 year old who took the cocaine we don't live in their shoes so when someone can say it from your point of view and i'm I'm going to look up your um, blog, Wise Old Women, because I agree with you. We, we throw away people in this culture as it is, and we don't revere people who have years and experience. We look at them as like disposable, like they're an old piece of like exactly. whatever, and it's just not fair. And hopefully everyone who will be listening to will be old someday. I just said that to my mechanic this morning. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to be 64 and right. you're going to ask a dumb question to someone and you don't want them to laugh at you. And he laughed and he said, oh, you look pretty good for 64. <laughs> well, I'm going to be 80 in three weeks. It's wonderful. It really <laughs> is. No, but it's wonderful because look at, and that's what's so great about President-elect Biden, you know, in the same of age. And when people say, isn't he too old? I said, by what standard? Like, right. you know, I know there are he's people, got a brain. <laughs> he's got a brain. He's got connections. He's got compassion. He has a lot of great qualities. And so do you, Carol. And you're like, you're, you're a good another 30, 40 years of keep going. <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> well, I, well, I plan on it. I plan on living a long time. Well, I don't know why I plan on it, but I'm just <laughs> give up. Well, that's good. That's but anyway, good. I didn't mean to be so long. The people here know me, so they know I get emotional and they know that I'm very sincere. I don't speak unless I think I have something valuable, but I thank you and I thank you for being in Shelly's class because those students, they, I, they'll never forget you. And that's really what life well, is. I love them, yes. They, they, I, they, are, they are still talking about you, Diane. And a lot of them had to work so tonight. cute, I enjoyed could, that, yes. And so they said they couldn't come tonight because they had to work. I said, don't worry, Eva will we'll be recording it. I will get the link. And so even though there aren't a lot of students here tonight, your words will get out to our students uh, through right. the Women's Center. They share a lot of stuff, the Multicultural Center. And of course, you know, you can't get rid of me, Carol. I share all this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so I, I personally want to thank you as well for doing this second uh, round for us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good luck to Bristol. You all stay safe and keep your masks on and <laughs> all that stuff. And uh, the vineyard is having a spike, a bad spike. I'm staying in like total. I don't want to see anybody. <laughs> but we had 20 cases this weekend. Wow. It's on the vineyard. Nobody's here. I was going to say, that's just with the residents. The summer people have gone home. 
No, 50,000 of them stayed like me. <laughs> okay. Well, so yeah. I'll take care, Carol. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I do want to add everyone to, I did put in the chat Carol's website so you can find out about the blog. As others mentioned, it is going to be recorded so you can share this. I'll, once you, uh, I get the link, I'll share it with everyone on this call as well as um, it'll be hopefully to put it on our YouTube channel. Um, Where's my link? Oh, I'll, I'll send you a link too. <laughs> the record is, so, um, once it's all done, um, I'll send everybody a link. But I also want to thank you so much. This has been a partnership between the Multicultural Center as well as the um, Communications Department here. And we're all very grateful for your story. I know I was very inspired and you had me on the edge of my seat with the Martin Luther King story. So it was well worth the wait. So thank you so much and everyone on the call. Thank you. Thank you.